All right, last time. Uh, we covered the, the basics of the neural networks and uh, how, so we've derived these two equations, how to update the, the W1s, the one on the top level, the, I mean the parameters on the top level, and how to update the Vs, the parameters uh, in the lower layer. And uh, uh, if you guys recall, the uh, derivation was not that bad. It was pretty straightforward. It was using just uh, the basic calculus, the chain rule. And at the at the uh, by the end of the class, I said that the certain portions, uh, uh, certain parts of the uh, the derivation could be reused when you go below, like as you go lower, lower, lower down the down the layer. And today we'll talk about that briefly. Okay. So uh, yeah. So if you have multiple, so this derivation was done with the assumption that there was only one hidden layer. But if you start increasing your hit number of hidden layers to to increase the complexity of your model or to increase the uh, uh, expressivity of your model or, or so, so that you can like approximate more complex functions like this. So in this case, you have the input layer here, X here, and the output layer. Well, this time we have three, three output nodes instead of one. So this means that we're probably doing like three-way classification task. And so there are like what, uh, like one, two, three, four, five, all the way to like L minus uh, capital L minus one hidden layers. And uh, if, if you recall uh, that I last time I've divided the value between like pre-activation pre -activation value and the uh, after activation value. So we're doing the same thing here. We're just changing the notations because I'm borrowing this, this, uh, this figure from a this very nice website. So, okay, so Z is what you is Z will be our pre-activation value. So here you can see that Z subscript K superscript L is the kth neuron. I mean the pre-activation value at the kth neuron of the elf layer. And Similarly, A superscript L subscript K is the after activation value. So the activation value is like often being a sigmoid function or tan H function or value function. So, okay, so here, yeah, so ZKL is the uh, pre activation value, basically the sum, weighted sum of these values, these values, weighted by the weights W's, and there's bias term here. And A is the after activation value, as you can see here. So then the and so the, uh, what is this? Okay, yeah. And the next time, like the, the nth neuron, nth neuron here in the L plus one layer would look like this. So, and it'll of course uh, be, it, it'll, the value will consist of weighted sum of A's here, like A, uh, A like 1K, A 2K, A 3K to A LK and all the way to like A like some, some K. So. Like AL, you can see the ALK here. So this is our new definition. If we, so what I'm doing is trying to, uh, trying to describe the chain rule. I mean the back propagation. So here, so th this is our new definition. And uh, uh, so in order to understand back propagation, we need to define a new term, which is the delta term. And delta term. So each neuron has a delta term. So there will be like delta here, delta here, delta here, delta here. All like the similar. There's a delta here, which is delta superscript L subscript K, and this will be. And the C here is a cost function, which is the same as the loss function, the the, the negative log likelihood. That's that. Sometimes we call that the loss function. Sometimes we call that the cost function. So the C is the no, negative log likelihood, and with respect to the pre-activation value Z LK. So that what that means is, is it, uh, the delta K, delta LK is how much the cost function or your negative log like function changes when the input to the case neuron at layer, case neuron at layer L changes. So it's, it's a rate of change, of course, because it's a derivative. It's a, it's a differentiation of C with respect to Z LK. So it's a rate of change. So how much the error function changes when you change the uh, the pre-activation value here. 
and you can define that all, across all hidden layer, all hidden neurons, like here, 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 everywhere. So that's our delta. And if you define delta like that, then the delta delta terms can be recursively defined. So delta L, which will be like old, like here, delta L is just it's the, just the top. It's, it's defined as the top layer rate of change, uh, top layers uh, rate of change of error when you when you like start manipulating the values of here. So it will, it will look like this. Basically, it's just a gradient of C, and uh, and uh, time times the sigmoid function or the preactivation function. I mean, I mean the activation function. So this the the top delta at the top layer can be defined like this and the delta in the middle layers like all, all the la intermediate layers like here 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 like anywhere can be defined like this so you can see that the delta l has a term delta l plus one in the middle so this is just a simple derivation so i won't go through it but it's just a and like you won't have to do this probably never because this will usually this is usually done by computer like the chain rules the gradients and all that like back propagation is all done by computers but i'm just trying to tell you how it is like conceptually how it's done recursively so you start from here and then delta l minus one will have the delta l term like this like if if uh, um, let me just have a Okay, so if delta if we change delta l minus one here, then it'll have uh, w w large l uh, trans. I I'll okay. I'll just go ahead with the transpose transpose uh, delta large l Hadamard product. So what what this is what this bullseye thing is just a, like a coordinate wise multiplication because now we're dealing with a vector so we're not just dealing with one single delta whereas so this means not not a just one single delta it's just it's a the vector of deltas in here like delta one l delta two l delta three l delta four l like like that so that it's a vector so it's delta l and there this will be a vector uh, so that is why this will be also a vector so that it was that is why there is like a coordinate wise multiplication like you you multiply value at each dimension of your vector so that's a Hadamard product and uh, uh, like this derivative of the activation function uh, this will be l minus one so you can see that in order to get the deltas here which is delta l minus one you all, you need delta here like here so that is why it's recursively defined so once you once you've calculated delta here then you can reuse it to calculate the deltas here and then once you've calculated that you can reuse it to, to calculate the deltas here 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 like recursively so you don't have to you don't in order to calculate this you don't have to do it every single time you just need to plug in the previous value to the current value to the current value and then do that again and again and again and again and again uh, yeah. The, when you actually need to update the weights, of course, because the deltas are just our deltas are just some some value that is that is representative the, this each neuron. But what you really want to do is you want to update the weights, not not do something with the neurons. So when you want to update the weights like this, then you can use the delta and your activation after activation value to calculate this so this is pretty you can see that all you had all you need to do is just you need all you need to do is just have these three equations and then just put that in a computer program and just recursively recursively calculate it when you want to do back propagation or and when you want to update your weights so from top and of course because this comes from the top layer to the bottom layer you can see that l plus one is required to calculate l which means that you need the previous upper layer to calculate the current layer. So that is why it's back propagation. You start from you start from the top and then you go all the way to the bottom. So that is why it's it's back propagation, not 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 not, not this way, right? Okay. So it's pretty pretty fast, but you still need to. It's pretty fast, but you still need to like um, uh, 
need to memorize certain values like like this and this in order to actually go back and back and back. So you still need some a large memory. If if your network is large, then you need to still remember a lot of things, and you that requires a lot of memory. So that is why a really really large neural network model will not fit into your GPU memory, your, your video memory, because your, your VRAM is typically like 12 gigabytes or 18 gigabytes. These days, certain NVIDIA chips have like 20, 24 gigabytes of video memory, but still like if your model is like humongous, then you need to remember a lot of things to do that propagation and that won't, you won't, you won't be able to fit your humongous model into a single, v, single GPU. All right. Okay, I need to erase this. All right, so uh, is there any anything that you want me to go over, anything that you don't understand throughout, throughout the chain rule and the back propagation and all that? Any, uh, any uh, clarification? No? All right then. If you have no, if you don't have any question that you've basically, you're basically uh, grasping, you've basically understood how how the neural network works, and all all the neural networks that I'm all the models and neural networks and techniques that I'm gonna introduce from now on to the end of this in the end of this course uh, is just the same thing. All you all, all the only thing that you need to remember is that how you use the chain rule to derive the back propagation, and then the computer does it for you. So in practice, a computer uses a package called Autograd. It's a automatic gradient calculation, I guess, Autograd. And uh, so there are certain uh, famous, famous libraries of Autograd for, that, can, that does the back propagation for you. So Theano is the one that came probably very, in the very early, early days, like in 2014, 2015. And it was developed by a uh, by Yoshua Bengio's lab in in the uh, University of Montreal. So so the the group of students and uh, professional engineers in that lab, Yoshua Bengio's lab, wrote the code of Theano. And so it was a pretty early uh, early autograd package. It was not that easy to it wasn't that easy to implement neural networks with Theano back then. Then Google came up with TensorFlow and uh, before PyTorch, there was Torch. Torch was written with Lua, so I, I don't really know much about Lua, but uh, DeepMind used to use Lua. So, like the early AlphaGo and the uh, the, neural, the reinforcement learning agent that that does like Atari that plays Atari games, the really old old game uh, like like seventies eighties game that they were all written with Torch, and then. That was, which means that it was written in Lua. And, and I think Facebook adopted the PyTorch project and now like a lot of users are moving from here to here. I mean, a lot of uh, researchers basically because PyTorch is a lot easier. Well, not, it's, certain parts are way easier when you do things with PyTorch com compared to TensorFlow. So PyTorch is getting a lot of traction these days and Google is having a hard time trying to, uh, Replicate the uh, ease of the, the ease of use of PyTorch because TensorFlow is very like industry focused, not not research focused, in my opinion. All right, and a neural network model in in these in these packages, what is could be Fiano, TensorFlow, PyTorch. There are certain others other like libraries like MXNet or uh, I forgot. There are a couple more, and they are all using a directed acyclic graph to represent a neural network. So theoretic acyclic graph meaning, well, I guess everybody's at least familiar to some extent what graph is. So like, um, yeah, something like this. So this is basically a, a graph. So, and the edges are directed and it is a cyclic. So there can't be any cycles. Like you, can't, you can't go like from here, here, here. Like you can't, there can't be any cycles. So it is using the acyclic graph 
to represent neural, ne neural networks, which is pretty, in pretty intuitive because uh, this, if you think, I mean, this could be your output node, but so each node has a certain mathematical operation that needs to be done, such as like doing sums or multiplications or activation function, which is sigmoid function often. So uh, you can represent all the mathematical operations that needs to be done for your neural network as a, a cyclic graph. So uh, maybe I should have, I should have, um, um, All right, well, I mean, I guess there could be a time to uh, to talk about how to write codes in PyTorch, I guess, but I guess we can do that in the future, but just to... Let's see. So let's say that there are, I'm trying to under, tell you how, how like, DAG or directed acyclic graph is used to represent neural networks. So, for example, let's say that at some point you need to put your output value to an a uh, through through a uh, activation function, which happens to be a sigmoid function. So, a sigmoid function will be here, and then your your uh, your activation value less. I mean, pre-activation value let's say z, and then you you'll get a some value. Let, let's use the same notation as before a. So your your Pre-activation value will go through your activation function, sigma, sigmoid, and then it'll go through, and then that becomes an A, the activation, activated value. So, and there's a node here, node here, node here. And uh, in order to use autograd, every single node needs to contain a derivative of its, of its, of its mathematical operation. So sigmoid, inside the sigmoid, I mean, we're talking about code, so it's uh, it's like an object, and there will be properties of this class. So the class class like name will be will be um, sigmoid. And uh, it'll hold a value. Uh, no, it won't hold uh, the value will be hold it, it will be held in somewhere else. Basically, it'll have a mathematical formation uh, formula for uh, for its differentiate for its der derivative. So there will be a property called derivative because it's a class. Derivative in here and here, and it'll be as I told you. Uh, if you do the if you differentiate sigmoid function with respect to its input, it'll be like sigmoid times one minus sigmoid. And there'll be some other, other properties here and here. Basically, it, every single node in your DAG will have a derivative. So when you start back propagating, you can do, all, you can act, you go backwards and you use this, you use this property or the class member property to do the chain, to start using, uh, to start, calculating all the gradients with using the chain rules. And when you're using the chain rule, you'll, you'll require, this is required basically. So, so when you want to define a new mathematical operation in, in any of these, like TensorFlow, Fiat and the PyTorch, you need to uh, define its derivative so that the autograd package will be able to use it when it's doing backpropagation. So each yeah each node contains derivative of the math its math operation and the error signal is propagated from the output nodes to the input nodes it's the same thing you start from start from the top and then it goes all the way to the bottom and uh, there will be like weights and all that all like in the with this, it's somewhere in the uh, directed acyclic graph and they will have its own own math formula to how how you how it can update itself if it's a weight I mean the parameter all right. Yeah, I mean, if you go to PyTorch or PyTorch.com or TensorFlow.com, wherever, like if you just look it up on the internet, there will be a very, very thorough tutorial how it is written. And actually, they are all open source projects. TensorFlow, PyTorch, they're all open source projects on GitHub. So you can actually see the source codes of the, uh, how, it, how it does the autograd, if you're interested in that. All right. All right, so time to talk about assignment two. So I hope everybody's ready to do assignment number two. It's been quite a while since we did assignment number one, which is just 
city training. So this is more of a uh, coding practice, I guess. So we're what we're gonna do is hospital readmission prediction, and let's just. All right, so everybody can access this uh, access this document because I. So you can use you can click when when you download your slide from the classum, you can just click it in order to open that. So the objective, just we're just going to cover what we've done, what we've covered. I mean, we're just going to try practice what we've covered during the class, which is hospital readmission prediction. So objective is given a hospital admission record predict whether the patient will return to the hospital within 30 days. It's the same thing. So I, I hope everybody is super familiar with this. Data set, of course, everybody has downloaded Mimic3 either through my link or through actual PhysioNet. So data set will be Mimic3. And it's almost exactly the same. So tables and features. So you are to use the admission, four tables at least, which is admissions table, diagnosis table, CPT. So instead of using Let's actually let's click this. So during the class, during the class, what I when I was introducing this prediction task, I used procedures ICD instead of CPT events, but they are almost exactly the same. So in procedures ICD, all you need to do was to extract ICD nine code for the procedure, but in CPT events, sorry, CPT events, all you need to do is just extract CPT code. That's the only difference, right? So there's admissions table. You need this is probably just a suggestion, but as about you, uh, no suggestion part will come later. So you need to extract marital, marital status, ethnicity, diagnosis from the admissions as a feature, and then from diagnosis table you need to extract ICD-9 code from the CPT events. Extract CPT code from the prescriptions, which is which is the drug medication table, from the prescriptions, extract the drug. So in, in, case, of pres in case of the uh, prescriptions table, there are a lot of information. Like, it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty long list, but forget about all the other, all the other information, just extract this as a feature. Oh, yeah, the, the drug code, that's it. And of course you need to, you guys, all you, all, all of you need to map the string in string features into the integer features, as I uh, as I've talked as I've talked about during the class. And uh, okay, so and these are different tables, so you need to link these information using either the hospital admission ID HADM ID. They are all there always. There is all HADM ID here. There is. Um, HADM ID here, like it's everywhere. So basically, it's just a unique identifier given per one hospital admission. And then you need to link link all those hospital admissions by the subject, or which is the patient, so that you can, again, I'm just repeating the things that I've talked about during the class. You can sort them by time, by their admission time, so you can, Sort you, you can order them on a timeline and then see if there is like a following readmitting readmission happening within 30 days to the to the current one. So use subject ID and HADM ID to link these information together. And some things to consider. So duplicate feature values. For example, if some drug occurs multiple times in a single hospital admission, how are you gonna handle that? It's up to you. Either you either you count the number of occurrences or just you, you do like like a binary value or some other way it's up to you and some other things to consider unknown feature values for example if your training data does not include some diagnosis code a so you're going to extract diagnosis codes from here and if if it so happens that your training data does not contain a specific diagnosis code but your test data does so, so that's an unseen feature value so how are you going to handle that? So that is again up to you. As long as you do it reasonably, it doesn't matter. But you shouldn't use the fact that the test data contains diagnosis code A because that would be cheating. 
right? Once you've trained your neural network model, or well, not neural network, we're going to do logistic regression this time, but once you've trained your prediction model and launch it in practice and in real, and in like a real setting, you, there can be occasions where you see, where your model sees a new feature, a new value, unseen value. In that case, you need to be able to handle that. I mean, you can, you can decide it, you can decide to ignore that. That's probably the easy, easiest way to go. And I suggest you do that because trying to deal with unseen values is a very difficult job. All right, labels. So it's just, again, it's the same thing. You, uh, you sort your admission records via uh, their admission time, or it could be discharge time, doesn't matter. Just sort them by, by temporal order. And then if, if there's a hospital admission within 30 days, which means, so in order to calculate the 30 day criteria, what you need to do is you need to extract the discharge time of the ith admission and the admission time of the I plus, I plus like the next admission. Oh, actually the order should be, order should be reversed here. That's a weird thing. Oh, it's my mistake. Like this, because because this comes after, so the the value here will be larger than the value here. So, all right. If that is within less than thirty days, then that is a positive example. If there's another hospital admission after thirty days, then, uh, if there if there is, yeah. So because this was within thirty days, but if there is another hospital admission after thirty days, that's a negative sample. And as someone one of the students has asked me if there is, if we don't know if there is another admission after the current admission, then the current admission record should be filtered out. It, it won't be included as a, as a training sample because we don't know. Because if, if you start, if you order your admissions in a temporal order, then the last one, the very, very last admission, we don't know if there is readmission after that or not. So we are not going to use the last one. So I hope that's clear to everybody. All right. And data split. So you're going to split your data into training set and test set. And how you do it is pretty is very simple. Any admissions that has a HADM ID ending with digit eight and nine should be left out as a test set. And all the others should be used as a training set. So basically, you're using 80% as a training set and roughly, roughly 80% as a training set, 20% as a test set. And you need to do two things here. One is pre-processing Mimic3, and the other is actually training a logistic regression model. So your data format, after you've pre-processed Mimic3, you need to, your pre-processing script, the code, should produce these four things. X train MPY, Y train MPY, X test MPY, Y test MPY. So basically this is just the N by M matrix, the training matrix. So N is the number of samples, M is number of features. Well, or no, it's not exactly number of features, it's the dimension used for features. Because when you map string values to integer values, you're, there will be a lot of like, it'll be super sparse basically. Y train is the label. So X is a matrix, Y is a vector. X test is test data and Y test is a test label. And that's it. And uh, note that all files must be in the NumPy float format. So. I've used NPY here, so it should be in the NumPy format. And model evaluation, just simply download, I mean, install scikit-learn and use logistic regression, and that's it. And as I've shown you, uh, it's just five line code. This is it, just copy paste this and uh, recycle what it, I mean, reuse whatever parts that are necessary to do this. So logistic regression and use both. And in order, once you've trained your network, trained your model with the training data, evaluate your model using the test bed, test data via AURC and AUPRC. So for example, AUPRC, you can use this function, average, pre average prestigious, prestigious score. This is not exactly the same as AUPRC, but it's like semantically the same. So you can, Use the Y test here and your predicted value here. Plug in, plug in them, plug them in. That's it. You don't need to. You don't need to meddle with all these. And just plug them in, and it'll. It, this will return a score for you. Just 
like this. That's it. All right, so use both ARRC and UPRC and use refer to this page for installation. Yeah, so if you don't know how to install scikit-learn, just click this page. What to submit? So you need to submit two codes and the specs. First code is pre process. I mean, even the names should be the same in order to save time for your, when, when TA does the uh, like assignment evaluation, just please strictly follow all the specs here so that you don't waste TA, the TA's time. All right, so preprocess make that pi. This needs to be, this is the prop preprocessing code. Command, command must be Python, the code, and the input path and the output path. So the input path is where the, where the, all the, like the CSV files are located. Output path is where you will write the full, the following, the four outputs, which is the, these four outputs. And the, this is where you train and evaluate your logistic regression. And command must be again Python, this file, and the input path. And the input path is where the four, the training, the train test, train test files are located. And your code should use standard out to print these four values. Training AURC, training AUPRC, test ARRC, test AU, test AUPRC. This is a typo. And each metric, so each each of these values should be printed per line. So your your code should print four lines in total. All right. And so a simple warning: do not throw away your code because it'll be your next assignment will be much easier if you reuse some parts of your code. So don't just don't just delete it after you've submitted your code. And the uh, the the score will be such as. Uh, as follows. So if you submit both codes, both codes meaning this and this and this, if you submit both of them, you get five points. But please don't submit blank files. So five points. And if you correctly pre-process pre three, so the TA will come up with a way to evaluate whether you've pre properly pre-processed the mimicry. If you did, 10 points. And if your logistic regression model shows reasonable performance, if you've properly trained your logistic regression model, 15 points, which is 15 points is the full score, is the perfect score. No late submission. Please don't make, please don't waste your TA's time. So no late submission. And there's a slight bonus. So this is for some, some of those students who are pretty ambitious or who want to explore their capacity. Try to use other features. For example, the gender information from the patient's table. You've noted, you might have noticed that I've excluded the patient's table in the tables, four tables above. So you, if you want to, you can like extract certain features from other other tables. Not 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 limiting, not limited to patient's table, but there are a lot of tables. So you want, you might want to, you might want to use a lot of features. And the, oh, there's a question. What is a reasonable performance? That depends on that depends on the TA's performance, basically. So, I would say it's probably AURC of like over seventy would be a, achievable. I mean, seventy percent, seventy percent. So, like as, as I said, fifty percent AURC is just random guessing. So that's basically doing nothing. You've learned nothing. So fifty percent. So any please. Try to get any value above 50% AURC or 0% AUPRC. That means that your model is learning something. And then, just based based on my based on my previous experience, I would say readmission prediction is not that easy. So I would say it's probably not. You you probably won't get like 80 85% AURC would be very very hard without using neural networks because this is logistic regression. So this will it won't be very easy to reach reach like 85%. I would say somewhere around 70% is a reasonable performance, but that totally depends on the TA because your bonus will also depend on the TA. So try to use other features to increase your model performance. Anyone who shows better test AUPRC, better test AUPRC, then the TA will get bonus five points, bonus five points. So that means if you get this, then you don't have to do like the next, next, uh, next homework to get like the perfect perfect score because you've already gained like advanced advanced eight five points for the bonus. So, all right. So this is the whole spec, and uh, I hope this is clear to everybody. Any question or any part that you want me to repeat in Korean?
No? All right. Okay, I, I hope this is pretty easy because I've literally gone through all the steps to be able to do this during the class. So. Okay. All right, go back back to here. Yeah. All right, so submission. Send your material, which is the two codes, the pre-processed material code and train logistic regression code. Send your code to the head TA, which is uh, email email address here. Due date is two weeks from now, so April 20th, midnight. No late submission. Again, as I said, no late submission. Because I'm giving you two weeks. Two weeks is a lot, a lot of time, basically. All right, so this is the end of this chapter, number five. So we're going to jump into a more advanced neural network, which is recurrent neural network today. All right. So today's topic, modeling. Uh, yeah, we're going to continue down the path of deep learning approach, and we're going to cover recurrent neural network, which is probably like the go-to model for dealing with time series data or longitudinal electronic health records. And then we're going to briefly cover GRU, gated recurrent unit, and LSTM, long short-term memory. They're all like GRU and LSTM are variants or like the advanced version of RNN. So if you understand RNN, then these are pretty like straightforward. These are just more complex version of RNNs. Okay, so the reason that we're going to talk about RNN is to be able to properly handle uh, longitudinal electronic health records or time series and any sequential information, basically. So, so we're going to talk about encounter records over time. So encounter. It, it could be an inpatient encounter, it could be outpatient encounter. It's just the encounter is when a patient visits a hospital. So this is more, more general than just mimic three. We're talking about, in a general sense, what happens when a patient goes to a hospital. So it's, it could be like ICU, it could be outpatient, doesn't matter. So each visit or encounter consists of multiple things. Basically, a lot of tables can like tables have different kind all kinds of information. So we're gonna talk about those information. So each visit, the first visit, let's say in the first visit, the patient was diagnosed with cough and fever and was prescribed with Tylenol and also had an IV fluid. So this these two are diagnosis. This is medication, this is typically a procedure. And then the next time the patient visits the hospital, and so it's pretty light, it's cough and chill only. So the patient was diagnosed with cough and chill. And then the next time, patient was diagnosed fever, and then again, Tylenol was prescribed. And this time, patient got a chest X-ray, so a new procedure. So you can see it's a, a patient record. For, I mean, for a single patient, can be viewed as a sequence of, or a set of codes, a sequence of a set of codes. So this is a set of code. This is a set of code. This is a set of code and it forms a sequence. So it's a sequence of set of codes. And in order to do certain predictions such as like given three, given, given all the like previous past records, past medication, past patient record, can you try to predict whether the patient will have heart failure in three months, three months? So in this case, let's say the patient had only three visits over like 10 years or whatever, like this is their entire visit. And given that, you're trying to predict whether the patient will have developed heart failure or be diagnosed with heart failure within three months. So this is a long, this, heart failure is like a, like a, it's not a chronic disease, but it's a disease that develops not just over a day or two, it develops over like, like years of time. So it's like a, like cancer or something like that. It's, it's not like acute, uh, well, Kind of thing that you develop overnight. I don't know, like like in like I don't know, like you you play soccer and then you fall down and you break your bone. Like that's not a that's not a like a long term thing. So heart failure is decided by your like lifestyle. You don't you don't work you don't exercise. You eat a lot of like fat and you never walk or whatever. So it's, heart failure is a it's it's a manifest manifestation of your lifestyle. So it develops over time. So it's pretty it's a pretty nice idea to to try to predict your heart failure using all the uh, information from from your past, not just based on one admission, 
or one encounter, you want to predict certain diseases using all the information from the past. And in order to properly do that, you need to learn a good representation of the patient themselves. So before we were talking about hospital admission representation vector or ICU admission representation vector. Like we were always coming up with a representation vector, like a, like a, a 40,000 dimensional thing, like binary vector. But in the same sense, we want to learn or we want to come up with a nice representation vector that can represent all this, like all the past information of the patient. And so how we're gonna do that is, I mean, in, in the classical approach, we're just gonna count them all. So if, like, like using, using all the information, all three visits, this, this patient had like cough, like one, two, two times, fever, one, two, two times, Tylenol, two times, IV fluid, one, chest x-ray, one. So you, you have like each, each dimension, again, each dimension just represent corresponding to a specific information or feature, and then you just count them all. Like this could be x-ray, this could be fever, this could be, uh, uh, IV fluid, this could be something like cancer because we've never seen cancer in the previous record. So that's basically it. And then you, that will be your patient representation vector. And then you put that through logistic regression and that will just tell you yes or no. Like, yes, this patient will develop heart failure or no, this patient won't develop heart failure. So I hope this is pretty, 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 very clear because we've done this a lot of times. So this, you can do that. So certainly you can do that using like old classical method, but, oh, and the, and so if you start using, trying to use deep learning, then everything is a vector. Uh, so let's, I guess we can actually go back a little. So here, like here, when we're using even a single hidden layer, the weights between the input and the hidden layer, certain parts were, responsible for representing certain feature. For example, this red row was responsible for representing, what was this? This was, this was admission type. So this was emergency, right? So this red row represents, is responsible to represent emergency concept. This red row was responsible for representing the divorced concept. So in the same sense, so in neural networks, features are represented as a, as a vector or sometimes people call that embedding or like, like latent embedding or distributed representation. There are a lot of names, but, but people call that usually embedding. So concepts are represented as a fixed size vector. In the pre, in previous slides that I've just shown you, they were, they were using four dimensional vector, but let's say just let's generalize. Let's say we're gonna use N dimensional vector to represent each concept. So cough, Tylenol, IV fluid, these are, discrete concepts, these are not scalar values like your blood pressure or something. Cough, you either have it or not, Tylenol, you either have it or not. So these are discrete values and they can be represented as an n-dimensional vector. And the values in the vector will be decided by backpropagation, by training your own neural network. Specific, specific values are learned during training. So these values, so this is a weight matrix and the weights are learned by backpropagation basically maximize, like minimizing your negative log likelihood. And that is how you decide the values like in each cell here, like here, 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 here. Same, same thing, like n dimensional vector, each value in each, each coordinate or dimension is decided by just trying to maximize your prediction performance. So, and the interesting thing is, so if you've properly learned them, the cough representation vector, Tylenol, embedding, IV fluid embedding, if you properly learn them, you can, you can actually scatter them in a two-dimensional plane. So this is an n-dimensional vector, but you can shrink their dimensionality down to two by using some techniques like PCA or T-SNE. Uh, and you can scatter them in the two-dimensional vector. And uh, if you've done a good job of learning those representation vectors or embeddings, it'll make a lot of sense visually. So here, each dot, here each dot is a diagnosis code, the ICD-9 diagnosis code. And the, the colors, like the pink here, the orange, the green, dark green, the light green, they represent a category of a, like a high level, high level diagnosis. 
So all, all the pink ones are, uh, well, I, I guess I don't know what all the pink ones are. And so the reason that I've done like a lot of circles is because they, they form a subcategory. So the colors represent like a higher category and the circles represent subcategory. So all, all, the, all the pink ones here represent our diagnosis codes that are that correspond to complications of surg surgical procedure or medical care. So once you've gone to a surgery after that, you, something, some, something could go wrong basically. So the, all, all the diagnosis codes related to that is, is grouped here. Oh, I guess the, I guess the pink ones are related to like surgery or 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 uh, like an accident, like bone fracture, like fracture of lower limb, fracture of your ribs, fracture of humerus. Well, I don't know what humerus is. Other fracture of upper limb. So like like all the pink ones are basically fractures, like breaking your bone or going through a surgery to to heal your bone, whatever and the circles here represent different types of fracture, like fracture of lower limb, fracture of upper limb. The same thing goes on here, like the, the light green, like th these are uh, cardiomyopathy, something rela related to your heart and hypertension with complications. All, again, something related to your, your circulation system. Uh, uh, yeah, other circulatory disease. So I guess all the green, light greens one are, are related to circulate, circulatory disease, like Sunan, Sunan Ge, So. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is that if you've learned a great, if you've done a great job of learning these specific values for the n-dimensional vector, then when you visualize them on a 2D plane, they will form, they will make a lot of sense, basically. So, and the interesting thing is that you've never told your neural network that like these diagnosis codes are related to each other. So you've never given like a domain knowledge or prior knowledge. It just learned on its own by going through a lot of data and trying to maximize its prediction performance. And by doing so, it is trying, starting to pick, pick up uh, like the semantics of the diagnosis code. Like, oh, this diagnosis code is probably related to that diagnosis code and something like that. And so uh, if anybody's familiar with like or vec this is basically what's happening here. Like in or vec the like king and queen are like in the similar space. Men and women are in the same similar space. It's exactly the same. Like certain diagnosis codes are within the same similar similar like vicinity neighborhood. All right. So going back. So uh, yeah, we so going back, we want to learn the good representation of the entire the patient themselves, the patient record. And uh, now we're talking. About, we're gonna explain this or describe this in a new deep learning sense. So all the features or concepts are converted to a vector or an, an embedding. So you can see that the cough is converted to a cough embedding, fever embedding, tylone embedding, IV fluid embedding, like, yeah, like all these will all have embeddings basically. And uh, just, just uh, like naturally these, Four things happen within the same visit. These two things happen within the same visit. These three things happen within the same visit. So maybe it's a good idea to sum them all up, like cough, fever, tylenol, IV fluid embedding, because they happen in the same visit. So maybe you wanna sum them all up, sum these two up, sum these three up, in order to derive the visit embedding or a visit representation vector. So before we were talking about, in MIMIC3, we were talking about hospital admission representation vector. This is the same thing. This is the encounter vector or visit embedding basically. So this will this embedding will be represented of visit one. This vector will be represented of visit two, visit three, so on and so forth. So everything, everything in neural network is basically just some embedding, some vector. Like your words are can be converted to a vector. Your sentence could be converted to a vector. Your document could be converted to a vector or your image could be converted to a vector. Like everything could be converted to a vector basically. Right. I mean, when I say vector, rep I mean the representation, latent representation vector. All right. And once you've had, once you have the, the visit one, visit two, visit three embeddings, this is now, now is the time to feed them into your neural network. Because so visit one comes before visit two, visit two comes before visit three. So it's a, it's a sequence of visit. And if you have a sequence, it's a, Pretty nice idea to feed them into neural net, recurrent neural network RNA. I mean, these days people use transformer a lot, but before that, like, 
I mean, RNNs are still a very robust framework, uh, but but uh, in like in these like large scale, large model era, a lot of people turn transform, but still RNN is a very nice framework. And it's, it forms a great baseline. Sometimes it's even harder to beat RNN with transformer for some tasks. All right, so, okay, anyway. So we feed the visit sequence into our, our recurrent neural network. And what your recurrent neural network is, it's a uh, way to pre, it's a nice way to process sequential input. So when I say sequential input, it's just a sequence. So there will be some input X and it comes after that X2, after the X3, all the way to XT, which is the end of the sequence. Could be a text. So there, I mean, we have, like, there are a lot of sequence information in, in the real world. So text is one thing, like X1 could be like, I uh, love you dot, or I am a boy, you are a girl, something like that. Factory sensors are also sequential inputs. Like, like there are a lot of sensors in your like smart factories and stuff, and they, like they record certain certain readings every I don't know every five seconds, every ten seconds, or every like one minute or whatever, or every hour. And so that forms a sequence of input. Stock prices are a typical example. Uh, these are like your Apple price or Google stock or Samsung stock. Like they, it'll change over time. So it's a time series, and it's also again a nice, uh, like very. Uh, typical sequential input. Medical records, again, because this is like patient goes to hospital over time. So it's a longitudinal or time series data, basically. And some are, I mean, for example, text and stock price, I mean, they are still, they're, they're all the same sequence in sequential input, but their characteristics are a bit different because text consists of concepts like discrete concepts like i am a oh boy these are just words that mean nothing to the machine like the machine doesn't know what i is or dog is cat is just like discrete concept but stock prices will be a continuous value it'll be it's like sometimes like one day it's 200 dollars next day it's 201 dollars next day it's 203 dollars so it, it's it's a uh, it's a scalar value so even if text and stock prices are the same sequence inputs their characteristics are a bit different, but we will talk about that later. All right, so recurrent neural networks, it's, it's very easy. Um, so there's sequence of input x1, x2, x3, to all the way to xt, and you feed your input at each time step for each time unit, and it'll be memorized in the hidden layer. So it, because we were talking about neural networks, there's always hidden layer, and in neural networks, the hidden layer is what remembers all the the current input and all the previous input and the update rule because so you it was you need to you you're feeding new information x1 x2 x3 at every every time step so you need to update your hidden layer and the update rule is that hi equals some activation function could be 10h could be usually it's 10h i I don't think I've seen values used in uh, neural networks or even a sigmoid function. Usually it's 10H. So some, some activation function. Uh, and inside that is a parameter or weight times your current input, because it's ith time step, your current input plus a weight, some other weight times your previous hidden layer. So you're updating your hidden layer every time step. So you, you're, you have to reuse your previous hidden layer value, so h i minus one, you, and then you multiply that with some parameter, and then the, the bias term here. So you do this, and then you put it through a, a non nonlinear, like typically nonlinear activation function, h. So what you can see is this is pretty very straightforward. You're just mixing your current input with the previous hidden layer, and putting it through a non like non nonlinear activation function, and that's how you get the new h. And because of this, RNN can, pre, uh, RNN can process a sequence of an arbitrary length. It doesn't have to be like always 128. Like, like your, your input sample, your training samples could be unevenly distributed. Like some sample can be only five step, but some other sample could be 10 step. 10 step. Some other can be like 100 steps. It doesn't need to be the same steps all the time. Uh, theoretically, your RNN can record information to like infinite 
time horizon because there's no like there's no like limitate there's no limit basically you can just keep adding new information one two three like ten 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 hundred thousand million but usually the RNA forgets what happened in the very like time like a long time ago all right so okay so given that given all the hidden layers like h1 h3 h hd all the hidden layers what you can do is you can do like for example you can do sequence level prediction what what i mean by sequence level prediction is you 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 have a sequence all the all the way from x1 to xt and you want to make a prediction or a classification of that given sequence for example is this sentence a positive sentence so we're talking about sen sentiment analysis like 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 i like if we're doing like a product review, like Galaxy S review or iPhone review, this your your sentence will be either positive or negative, or or it could be neutral. But anyway, so like a positive, if, if this is a trying to predict if this is a positive sentence is a sentence level or a sequence level prediction, or again, will this patient have a heart failure? So given a patient record, trying to predict whether this patient will have a heart failure is again a sequence level prediction. And the typical way to do it is once you've fed all the information from the from like the back to the current time step like all the way from one to t your ht is supposed to represent so your ht is the representation vector for your sequence because this is supposed to hold contain all the information from the from the past so all the way from x1 x2 x3 all the way to xt ht is supposed to memorize or understand what happened throughout the sequence and you're going to use this representation vector like like a logistic regression function so ht is here then you have certain set of parameters you do like the inner product and then put it through a sigmoid function then you get like either one or zero i mean some value between one or zero so like yes this is a positive sentence or yes this patient will have heart failure something like that or another application is stepwise prediction so instead of predicting only one thing out of your sequence you can you can predict a lot of things per time step so for example if you're given a sentence is this word a positive word i i don't know if there's such task but i just made it up in order to make it convincing so like each word like if you start putting like i am a boy you are a girl whatever and then you can try to predict whether each word is a positive word so each time step like h1 h2 h3 all the way to HT, each HIs will be used to predict something. Or for example, will this patient die at this visit? Then you need to, then you need to make, make predictions based on each input or each visit or encounter record. So you're, you're gonna use H1 to predict whether this patient will die or H2 will this die like again, 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 repeatedly. So this is another way to use RNN to make Certain, do perform certain types of uh, prediction tasks. All right, okay, so just a little a technical detail. So these two, is this word a positive word? And will this patient die at this visit? Is actually different when used in practice, when, you, when it is done in test time. So why? So why is, why is it different? So this is technical detail, but Typically, when you are trying to deal with like a sentence, given sentence, then the entire sentence is is given to you before you start making predictions. Like, is like given a sentence, trying to predict whether each word is a positive word or not. You first need to input all the words in, like x1, x2, x3, and then then make a prediction. But here, trying to predict whether the patient will die at the at each visit or not, these come sequentially, like like x1 the first visit comes in and then you make a prediction and then the second as soon as the second visit is second visit occurs then you make another prediction and then third visit occurs then you make the prediction so it's more like real time unrolling compared to compared to uh when you just feed the entire sentence when you feed the entire sequence before making prediction and that makes quite a lot of difference when you're training your neural network model but we can deal with that later this is just yeah you, you don't need to this is just like a fun little technical detail that i want to cover all right so okay 
so far, so any question related to RNN? Because now we're gonna, from now we're gonna jump into how to use RNN to, to model longitude on EHR. So before that, does anybody have anything, any question related to RNN? Okay, so I hope everybody is super clear with RNN because the next assignment will be you need to implement RNN. You're not gonna use just RNN function from PyTorch, you're gonna implement your RNN. So hope everybody, everything is pretty clear to everybody. All right, so okay. Modeling EHR with RNN. So recurrent neural network accepts multiple medical records at each time step because multiple things like, for example, in visit one, four things happen. So this, your, your input could be a very long vector, like 40,000 dimensional vector, for example. And it'll be a very, very, very sparse vector. So like some, some very small number of dimensions will be, will have the value one, like cough and fever, Tylenol, I believe they will be turned on to one, but all the others will be zeros. Like, so it'll be 99% zero. So X1, the first visit vector with 40K element, one for each medical, medical record. So this will be your visit represent, well, it's not, yeah. So it's, it's like a raw representation of your first visit. And then you plug that into your embedding layer. So this is the first hidden layer that you use before you actually use RNN. So it'll be some parameter multiplied by your input X1, X1 being, being this actually. So it'll be your some parameter times X1 and this will, and, and the rows of this parameter or rows of this matrix, matrix will correspond to the embeddings for each dimension of this X. And then you put it through some nonlinear activation function, like for example, rel u and then, then your this output, when, once you've gone through this, your output will be your latent visit representation vector. So depending on what, what dimension you use for your matrix, for example, if you use four by 40,000, then your embedding layer, in your visit representation, I mean, latent v, visit representation will be four dimension. If you use 10 by 40,000, then your V1 should be 10, 10 dimension, so, something like that. People typically use like 128 dimension or 256, 512. These days, like if they use like transformer, sometimes they use like 1024 dimension. Anyway, so once you've do that, once you've put your X1 through this equation, you get V1, which is your latent visit representation vector. And then you put that into your RNN. So your RNN, the fir first time there is no previous H0, H zero will be just just zeros. Basically, you 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 define your first H as just a bunch of zeros. So there's only W V the new. We're using different parameters, like I mean, different weights. So embedding weights will be W X, but the ones that are multiplied to your visit or or the input to your hidden input to your RNN will be W V. And there is no previous H here, so. It'll be just WV, and I'm I'm just omitting, I'm just ignoring the bias term here. And then you repeat that process again in the next time step. So X2 becomes V2, and then you plug in V2 to your RNN. Now, now, now you you have the V2 times your WV, but you also have your H1 times WH. So you're reusing your previous hidden layer information. You're starting to mix up pre, like past information with the current information. And that becomes your H2. And then you do this again and again and again and again until the end, the, the end of your sequence, XT. So XT becomes VT. Then again, following the update rule, WV times your last visit and WH times your previous hidden layer value. And that becomes your, your final hidden layer value, HT. And then, then you can use HT as as a, as a patient representation vector, because this is, the patient has made all these different encounters over like periods of like five years or 10 years. So this, this final hidden layer HT is supposed to be theoretically a latent representation vector for this particular patient. So it's a patient representation vector. And then you can use it 
and you can feed that into your like logistic regression basically so your w o is your just like your your parameter for the output function or logistic regression function so h t times w o uh gone through a sigmoid function then the outcome will be zero between zero and one point zero so zero meaning like no this patient will not have heart failure one meaning yes this patient will heart failure will have heart failure all right pretty straightforward right so yeah back in like 2015 2014 these were like like the pretty cutting edge stuff but now is everything is very obvious now And yeah, so if you're not doing binary prediction, but you want to do multi-class classification, like for example, let's say your outcome, you're trying to predict whether the patient will have a lot of disease, like there can be like tens and thousands of diseases. And in that case, like you're trying to predict whether the patient will have any one of the diseases, then you're, you should use softmax functions. So, so soft, softmax is what people typically use to do multi-class classification or multi-class prediction. And it's the same thing. You use the last hidden layer value HD, and then you multiply it to some some matrix or, or weight matrix, and you put it through a softmax function. And your Y would be a K dimensional vector, K being, meaning K being the number of options or number of classes. And uh, it, so the Y, should, y must be a convex, a convex vector. Convex meaning that if you sum up all the coordinates or all the dimensions of your y vector, then it should sum to one. And it follows this formula. So it's just exponential, exponential value, ex exponentiated value. Like you've seen this kind of stuff in lit, like lit sigmoid function. Sigmoid function is one over one plus exponential, exponentiated to like natural e raised to the power of negative, like x times theta so you, is, you you see these terms a lot so it's just this divided by all the other like this this part this like this means that j so this particular formula represents the probability that given x is going to have the output j class like there are like k class k number of classes so this is calculating the j class probability so there's j here and it is divided by all the probabilities of getting all the probabilities for the other classes basically you do one from k and now there's index k here so, yeah so there's like softmax function is tensorflow or or a pytorch so you can just call them in reality all right so okay so now we've covered all the basics about rnn so any questions so far yeah, this is pretty straightforward. So we've covered the uh, update rule for the RNN, and then we used RNN to do like heart failure prediction or some some patient level prediction using longitudinal EHR. All right, so moving on to GRU gated. So uh, LSTM is more popular in my in my estimation. LSTM is more popular than GRU in reality, and actually LSTM was proposed way before GRU. So LST, I think LSTM was uh, was published back in the 90s, like 1990 something. But GRU came out in 2015 by uh, Yoshio Benjil, the, the famous Gyeonghyun Cho, Dr. Professor Gyeonghyun Cho proposed gated recurrent unit. So, But gated recurrent unit is simpler than LSTM. So it's more like educational to go through GRU first and then try to describe LSTM. So gated recurrent unit is just more complex hidden unit computation than recurrence. So uh, the hidden, the update rule for recurrent, uh, the, the update rule for RNN was basically this. Just one line, right? It's very simple. Anybody can make code this in Python even. But GRU, the update rule is a bit more complicated. And uh, so yeah, GRU was introduced by Gyeonghyun Cho in 2014. And uh, oh, by the way, this whole thing is borrowed from the very famous deep learning for L N NLP course in Stanford, taught by Richard Socher. So, uh, if you want to get more insights into how, like, not just how, like, all the different types of models and techniques for doing like NLP 
kinds of things, you can just go go here actually, basically. So the main idea is main idea of GRU is to keep around memories to capture long distance dependencies. So in RNN, I said that theoretically RNN should remember all the things that happen over like the entire sequence, like one from like million. But in reality, that's never the case. Like it usually forgets after like I don't know, like like I don't know, fifty time steps or some something like that. It, it, doesn't really remember a lot of things from the past. And as I said, there was, uh, I briefly covered vanishing gradient problem in the very first quiz. So that usually happens a lot. So, oh, maybe, maybe I should have talked about that. So if you start to use like a very long sequence, then if you, um, okay, so I, like if you, if you uh, tilt, if you tilt this entire network, if you like tilt this entire network to by 90 degrees, then that becomes like a neural network with a lot of layers, right? So basically a recurrent neural network is a neural network with a variable number of hidden layers. Like not just one hidden layer, not just two hidden layers, not, not 50 hidden layers. It's not a fixed, doesn't have fixed hidden layers, fixed number of hidden layers. It has like a increasing or decreasing number of hidden layers. And if you start adding if you start using a, like a very, very long sequence, like 100 times step, 200 times step, that means your neural network is basically a neural network of 100, time, 100 hidden layers or 200 hidden layers. And if you start using like a lot of hidden layers, then this, the problem of vanishing gradient or exploding gradient will happen and it won't train properly. So, it, so that means that it's gonna, not going to pro train properly and it's not going to remember things that happened in the very lower layer, like the very first time steps. So in order to, to overcome that problem, uh, GRU used something called gates. So, so the gates are used to keep around memories to capture long distance dependencies. It allows error messages, error messages like the deltas that I've talked about today, the error message, something that is related to your loss function or cost function to flow at different strengths depending on the input. So uh, you'll, you'll, you'll start to understand what this means. Uh, give me just a second, let me get some water. All right. Okay, we're gonna change some notations because I'm borrowing this slide from the Richard, Richard Soldier class. So standard RNN, so this is standard update rule. And so HT, so instead of HI, we're gonna use HT. F is the nonlinear activation function, again. So this could be 10H. And WHH is what, what, you, what you multiply to the previous hidden layer. And HX is what you multiply to the current input. So instead of I, we're going to use T. So as I said, GRU uses something called gates. And ga the, the reason that it's called the gate is because it either lets the previous information flow through the current time step or not. So it's like gating function. Like it, let, it, pa it, lets, it, it lets the previous information pass or not pass, basically. So update gate is based on the yeah, there. I think uh, GRU, is, you, GRU uses two gates, the update gate and reset gate. So update gate here and reset gate. So update gate is uh, is calculated such a, like like this. So there's a, there's new set of weights basically. So there's WZ multiplied to the current input, and UZ multiplied to the previous hidden layer. And because it's a gate, you either let the information pass or not. So that is why it's using sigmoid function because sigmoid function. If you remember sigmoid function, uh, okay, so it's really hard to find my pen here. Sigmoid function looks like like this. So this being one and this being zero. So um, yeah, so sigmoid function basically forces the output, the activated value to Lay be, lie between one and zero. So 
and we wanna we want the gate to act as a gate. You let it pet you let the previous information pass or not. So it's binary thing. So that is why you're using sigmoid function here, basically. So you do some mixing of the current input and the last previous input using new set of parameters, WZ, UZ, and that becomes your update gate, ZP. And again, on a reset gate is, so update gate is like passing information or not. Reset gate is forgetting information or not, basically. It's just, that is why it's named as, as reset gate. Uh, so it's using a new set of weights, WR and UR, and you're, it basically it's the same thing. It's mixing up the current input and the previous input. And go getting and putting it through the sigmoid function again because we want to reset or not. We want to forget or not. So, so ZT and RT will be a vector of a lot of like ones and zeros. No, not exactly ones and zeros, like a lot of values that lie between ones and zeros. So, okay. So instead of doing this, where we first use some other new set of parameters to calculate ZT and RT at the teeth time step. And then, okay, so ZT and RT here. And then there's a new like intermediate memory content. So before we get to the final HT, there's HT tilde, which is calculated by this formula. So now it's using 10, so 10, 10 H, I, I keep saying like something called 10 H. So I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are familiar with 10 H, but if some of you are not. So 10 H is what looks like this so here it is it is one here is negative one so 10h is something that forces the activation value to lie between one and minus one so yeah and uh, so sometimes uh, yeah typically rnns were the uh, the activation function of the vanilla rnn the original rnn was 10h function as i said so then the new memory content so ht tilde is calculated like this. So it's using a new set of parameters. So there were WC, there were WR. Now we have W and U. And W is multiplied to the current input. Interestingly, U, let, let's just look, look at this first. So U is multiplied to the previous hidden layer, but interestingly, R, the reset gate, is coordinate wise, or this is the same thing as Hadamard product. Like if you have if you have vector here and vector here, and if you do like Hadamard product. Basically, what you get is another vector. And you multiply this value to here, like you multiply this to this and get this. And you, you multiply the second one to get to get the second one. Basically, you just, just dimension-wise, each dimension independently multiplied and then get the final vector. So that this is what, what happens here. Right. All right. So interestingly, the, the R reset gate is multiplied to this value. And then let's let's go on for now. So if reset gate is close to zero, then this value will be basically meaningless. Like the previous value, so previous value will be like lost forever because RT can't like if RT the gate reset gate is close to zero, like they won't survive. But if the RT, reset gate is close to one, then this information will survive. So and that is how the intermediate HT tilde is calculated. And the final HD, the actual content of the current time step is calculated like this. So it's a ZT, which is the update gate, multiplied by, well, again, it's the same coordinate wise multiplication, multiplied by eight, the, the last, hidden, last hidden layer. And it's one minus Z times the intermediate hidden layer and the intermediate hidden value. So this is a convex sum. Because Z can be either, the values of Z are either one, uh, lie between zero or one. So Z being here and one minus Z here is means, it means that it's a convex function, it's a convex sum. And let's say that if Z, the update gate is close to one, then what happens is that this term will survive and this term will be canceled out because Z is close to one. So that, and when Z is close to one, it means that you're, you're just gonna use the previous value again. You're just going to copy the previous hidden value to the current hidden value. And you're just going to forget about the, up, the new update, basically. But if the Z is close to zero, if the Z is close to zero, then, then now this part will survive and this part will be gone. 
And basically what this means is the, you're, you're going to, you're going to copy the intermediate hidden, hidden value, the HT tilde as your final, final value. And HT tilde is decided by this function. So if you, if Z is close to zero, then the reset gate will play its role. So if the Z is close to zero, then you're deciding, oh, I'm not going to just copy the previous value. I'm going to use a new value and how much, how much, like, how much more you're going to use new value or not is depend depends on the reset gate. So if the reset gate is close to zero, then you're just going to use current value only. If the reset gate is close to one, then you're still going to use previous value to some extent. So yeah, so that is why there are two gates, and it's it's a uh, might look complicated, but it's pretty easy. There's only you, yeah, you, they can't. You just need to do two calculations first. You just need to do two calculation first and then get this and then do this. So it's a four line thing, basically. You just have a for loop or while loop over the sequence and each loop and within each time step, you just do four calculations and that's it. So that's what GRU is. All right, moving. Any questions so far? No? All right. Okay, so, ah, it's already. 11, 10.30, so okay, I'll just quickly go through this. All right, so fine. Um, this is just a, like a schematic of like how all the different gates are interacting with each other. So XT, I told you that reset gate and ZT, the reset gate update gate is first calculated, the two line thing, and then they are used, and, and the reset gate is used to calculate the, til the tilde, the intermediate value. And then then the final, finally, we're gonna calculate HT. So this is just some, some schematic. But this is kind of like readable because there's only two gates. But when you go to LSTM, which has three gates, like it's pretty pretty much like like drawing a diagram is pretty much impossible. All right, so yeah, again, it's just the same. Yeah, this is just repeating over what I said. Like if reset gate is close to zero, then you're ignoring hidden previous hidden layer. If Z is close to one, you're just copying the previous value. If zero is close to zero, you're using the new new value. And if Z is close to one, then because you're copying the previous content, there's less vanishing gradient because you're just simply copying the previous value. So you're copying, copying, copying. So you don't get to, you don't, you don't have, like basically you forget less about previous information. All right. And interestingly, like the, the way that gates work depends on the problem that you're solving. Like if your problem, if your sequence requires that you memorize like long-term long -term information, then the update gate will update and reset gate will adaptively do so. If your task requires that you forget a lot about, like if it does not depend on previous information a lot, then update gate and the reset gate will also active, will be activated to do so. So it's a pretty, pretty flexible framework. Uh, yeah, we don't need to talk about this. This is like basically how you want to derive the derive the chain rule and all that. So, I mean, this is a pretty complicated function, but if you go one by one, just manually derive the uh, derivative of the, all of the functions like WZ, UZ, WR, UR, you can actually derive the uh, derivative or you can differentiate them by, by, by their input to update all the like new, new parameters here. But I mean, we're, gonna, we're not gonna do that. The package will come, do it for you. All right, so let, this is the last slide. So LSTM, it just has one more gate. Uh, so instead of using gate, uh, update gate or reset gate, it has input gate, forget gate, and output gate. So there are three gates, and three gates are calculated in the same fashion. Like there's new set of parameters, I parameters, F parameters, output, O parameters, corresponding to input, out, input, forget, and output. And you can you can think about forget gate as like whether to forget or not, like the name tells you so. And then there's also a new memory cell or the intermediate value, C tilde. And C tilde is calculated in the similar fashion. And then the final memory cell, I mean, in GRU there was intermediate value and the final value, but now there's intermediate memory cell, the final memory cell, and the final hidden layer. So it's a bit more complicated, but basically C tilde is multiplied by the input, and the forget gate is multiplied by the previous memory cell, and the final memory cell is multiplied by the output cell. So there's a lot of one more step involved, but basically 
the the philosophy is the same as GRU, and that is why I, well, that is why not me, but what, that is why Richard Socher decided to introduce GRU first and then go to LSTM because it's just one more gate and one more one more step of deriving the final hidden layer. All right, so this is the end of today's class. So okay, uh, if you have any question, you can stay around, stick around, and uh, ask questions to me or not. Uh, yeah. I'll see you guys this Thursday. And if you have any question, please answer me. I mean, please ask me through the class some more email, especially if you, have, if you have any question regarding the homework. Yeah, send the email to either myself or the head TA. All right, thank you very much. But uh, see you guys next Thursday. Bye-bye, guys.